Uh, first of all, I really want to thank you. I know I, I'm running a small college, and I know how busy that is, and you're running a, a very large country with many challenges. So I really appreciate the time that you're uh, affording us. For me, it's quite extraordinary. The, the times that I've interacted with you and the, the few times that I've met you, you seem to be a very down-to-earth person. And, 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 and that's a very interesting phrase that we use, down-to-earth, because the, uh, in Arabic, the term for the, what the Prophet ﷺ asked us to do is to is tawadha, which means to stay close to the earth. And so I just looking at that, um, I, I'm just curious how you've dealt with um, all these remarkable achievements. Uh, Sheikh Hamza, well, let me say one thing. Oh, you know, and I have, have a, had a very varied life. You know, someone who uh, finished his education, got a degree, but at the same time played international cricket. So normally when you play international sport, you have to be very focused. And, and it's a, to excel, you know, to become the best in, the, in your country, you really have to have that tunnel vision. And normally it's very difficult to study. You can't do two. Most uh, international sportsmen actually do not finish their studies. So because I did the two, I had, uh, you know, I had a bigger perspective of life. So if you, uh, if you, all you do is play sport all the time and you, you know, you have, uh, you, you have no other perspective in life. So this, the, everything becomes that sport. And, and so when you excel in it, you think, you know, you've conquered the world. And there's always a chance that you will, um, you know, you will have arrogance in you because you're so much better than the other players. So, you know, you, it's, it's a very natural thing when you excel as a sportsman and you, you know, you, you reach the top. So others are not as good as you. And, and because that's your world, you, you, you have this uh, a chance of, in my opinion, what is the worst quality in a human being? Arrogance. You can get arrogant. On the other hand, I played 20, almost 20, two decades of international sport. So in that period, you have lots of ups and downs. That also tells you a loss. Uh, you know, it, it, when, you, when you fall, it leads to a lot of soul searching. So when you go into the cycle of up and down, you know, when you reach the top and then you have setbacks. And over 20 years, I had lots of setbacks. I had a lot of successes, but a lot of setbacks. So during the low period in your life, it teaches you a lot. So you do not eventually lose your, you know, when you go up, your feet stay on the ground because you know that, you know, you're not always going to stay up there. So that's one. But really it is, uh, you know, later in my life, just at the end of my sporting career when I was blessed with Almighty's greatest gift, and that's faith, you know, I never understand this concept of people forcing into uh, someone to your religion or faith. Because for me, faith is, is a gift of God. You know, not everyone has this, this uh, iman of faith. So once you have that, then you have a completely di different perspective on life. Because you believe that success, respect are in the hands of God. This is, you know, clearly stated in the Quran. So once you know that, uh, when you have successes, you then attribute it to God. Uh, and you know that it's because of his will that you have succeeded. So arrogance disappears from your life. And then the most important thing that you control, what is the most destructive thing within a, in a human being is the human ego. If you do not control the, uh, the, the ego, it is very destructive. And I've seen it. Uh, you know, destroy human beings. So uh, faith, actually, true faith, iman, firmly makes you control your ego. And there's a tradition in American baseball that when, when, when they see a pitcher pitching a perfect game, all the other players leave him alone because they, they know he's gone into a kind of zone and, and they don't, they don't want to disrupt that. 
But what they do at the end of the game is they, they, they uh, push a, a pie, a cream pie in his face as he comes off the mound. And it, it's a way of reminding him, you know, you had a perfect game today, but tomorrow you might lose. So it, there is an awareness, I think, uh, in, in people of that up and down. We, we read in the history books that when a Roman general used to come back victorious, you know, there would be a man standing behind him when he would be taking the, all the applause from the crowd. Um, he would be telling him that, remember, you're human. Exactly. And I think this is something that a lot of people in positions, when they get into positions uh, that you've gotten into, they, they very often shut that aspect out and, and surround themselves. I mean, this is uh, one of the things that Aristotle says is that uh, tyrants uh, surround themselves with yes men, that they don't want to be uh, reminded of those things. And Pharaoh is, is a good example of that. And it's, it's very interesting that in the, in the Quranic narrative, the, the, the most repeated story is one of immense arrogance, which is Pharaoh, and then the humble servant of God, which is Moses. And then this idea that in the end, it's humility that God gives victory to. Um, I, I'm, one of the things about pride that really interests me is in, in I, I know in Urdu they say ghurur, which is very interesting because it taken from the Arabic, which is a kind of uh, self-delusion, that you, you enter into a delusional state from Arabic. Uh, ghurur is one of the names of the devil. And then... Um, and then there's this idea of izzet, which in, in Arabic is actually a positive thing. The Quran describes the believers of, as having a kind of dignity and, and a sense of self-worth. And I think what it seems to me is that in, 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 in many parts of the Muslim world, a lot of Muslims have lost that sense of civilizational pride. And I think it seems to me that what you're really trying to do uh, in, in, in an extraordinary country with an extraordinary people is restore uh, that, that pride and, and, and sense of, of who we are as, as, a, uh, as a people. The Quran liberates a human being when God says that there are three things that are in his hands. Number one is respect and humiliation. So you cannot be humiliated and you cannot respect unless God wills it. Number two is um, how much risk, in other words, how much you will, the sort of uh, money you will have in life, you know, uh, how much you will make in life. That is an also in God's hand. You can only strive, but he is the one who will determine how wealthy you will be, uh, become. And third is life and death. That's in God's hands. So in my opinion, these three, these three uh, areas are which give us the greatest concern. We are scared of dying. We are scared of being humiliated or being deprived of a livelihood. So in my opinion, when you have faith, you have complete belief that these, the things that cause you the greatest fear are in God's hands. And therefore, you realize that the only thing you have got in your hands is to struggle. Success lies in his hands, and which I've always tried to tell my, you know, my political party. I've always tried to make them understand this. Because, you know, when I came into politics, there were two things. Everyone, because there are mafias in politics, everyone, people were scared to come into politics because they were scared they would be killed or they would be beaten up by these mafias. So number one fear was actually of dying. And number two was of being humiliated because they had, they were powerful people. They would, uh, you know, I mean, my character assassination in these past 20 years, the sort of things they have come out against me and all sorts of scandals and, and, and fake news to, to humiliate me. But the reason why I, you know, I mean, I struggle all this time and for 15 years, really without much success, is because it was my belief that no human being can humiliate me, no matter what they say. And secondly, 
you know, life and death is not in, in my hands. It's, and you know, I had built this cancer hospital and I had seen friends of mine come in to the hospital perfectly healthy with a tumor and gone in a few months time. So this fear of dying is also a big impediment in a human potential, a human being achieving its potential. But the important thing which you said was pride. You know, uh, over my, during my life, I also realized that this uh, self-esteem, it, it is the greatest uh, uh, trait of a human being. And in, in, in our language, we call it gherath. It is, it is a great quality in, in a human being. Uh, and I, I, you know, I remember I was, my house was being built and it was the hottest time of the year. And I was just watching this house, the sun was blazing down and the laborers were working. And there was this one guy, you know, young man who was just, I mean, his shirt was drenched with sweat. And he never once stopped working, whereas others would sit in the shade for a while, have a glass of water and then come back. So at the end of the day, when he finished, I went in and handed him some money, which would have been a lot of money for him. And he asked me, he said, why are you giving me this money? I said, because, you know, I've so, I saw you the way you worked. He said, the work I did, I'm, I've been paid for. And please uh, keep your money. So the respect I had for this ordinary laborer was much more than all so many rich people I've met in my life, you know, who just do not have this self-respect and this dignity, or gharat, as we call it. And you're absolutely right that, you know, I find uh, people, uh, you know, who have dignity and respect, no matter whether they have money or not, you know, they command respect. You respect them. You know, it reminds me, I was, I was in, uh, I took my sons to Uhud to visit uh, uh, Sayyidina Hamza. And uh, that we, there were very few people there, but there was a man selling candy. He, had a, he was a little uh, like a Bedouin man, and he was selling candy on a, on a little uh, cart. And um, so I wanted to g get my boys something sweet at the place. And uh, they had 10 rials, and the candy was only like two, I think, rials. And I told the man, keep the change. And, and he, said, he said, no, the candy's only two rials. And I said, no, no, it's all right. You know, you can keep it. He said, look, I'm not a beggar. This is my job. And it's only two real. And he refused to take, like, what, what I was looking at as charity uh, because of exactly what you're talking about. And, and that, that is something I think God loves. It's, a, it, it's, it's that dignity that you carry with you. The, the Prophet ﷺ said in a very interesting tradition for me, I think, he said, the believer, al-mu'minu la yudhillu nafsa, the believer should never humiliate himself. And, and that gets to what you just said, is that really it's, it's, it's we who humiliate ourselves. Nobody can humiliate you if you have that dignity. Uh, they can attempt to take it away from you, but they can't. And, and that gets back to a question of how how you think we can, can restore this sense of dignity that for a lot of Muslims seems that there's almost a shame, in, especially in wealthy people. And I think it's something that, that I find very inspiring in you is that you, you know, you're not ashamed of your faith and your tradition, which is quite rare amongst uh, people that have entered into politics. There's almost a, a reservation in acknowledging the, the, the part of faith? Sheikh Hamza, two things. One, that um, la ilaha illallah, no God but Allah. That in itself gives you dignity. You know, the motto of my party when I started my party 25 years ago is You alone I worship, you alone I ask for help. Um, you see, in my opinion, true faith, iman, that in itself gives you dignity. Because just the fact that you don't bow in front of anyone but the one, that is a liberation of a human being. Uh, I've all, you know, young people ask me about uh, 
who do I respect or what is the concept of richness? You see, for me, someone who is rich is someone whose conscience has no price. You can't buy them. And that's what I mean, you know, this, uh, and you talked about the candy man and I talked about this laborer. People who, who, who don't bow in front of anyone, who do not allow their dignity, uh, lose their dignity, whatever happens, they are the ones who command respect. And, you know, if I, I read this uh, book after the, uh, it's called The Arab Conquest. It's after a prophet, um, you know, after, after his death. The way the Arabs spread all over the world, and it's very fascinating if you read that, it was not, they didn't have any technical advantage over all the people they, they defeated. The Mongolians, for instance, they also had, a, you know, conquered half the world very quickly, but they developed a certain form of warfare. They had these special bows which used to uh, shoot arrows much further than anyone else. They had these special horses and a war technique. But these Arabs had nothing. They were the same Arabs who have, were insignificant in front of Persian and Byzantine empires. So, but when you read about it, they were liberated souls. They were fearless. They were fired with a higher Im imagination. And this is the basis of, you know, if, if one, t one sports team is very talented, the other sports team has self esteem and respect, you know, they have pride, they will beat the talented uh, team. And I've seen this more often in my life. And this is really it. Uh, the problem when you say about Muslims and rich Muslims and wealthy Muslims, I've seen them lose their, their pride. I've seen them, um, you know, become servants of wealth. You know, they've, their wealth has made them uh, enslaved them actually and they stick to their wealth thinking that's everything so um, this is unfortunate in our muslim world we have very few uh, leadership in the muslim world which actually is tr truly liberated yeah okay leadership and this is something uh, also a really of great interest to me the uh, one of my teachers is um sayyidina qibar atas in from malaysia who I think is a, is a brilliant philosopher, but he wrote a book called Secularism, uh, which, which he identified as what he felt was one of the fundamental problems in the Muslim world, is the secularization of the Muslim mentality and th this loss of the sense of the sacred. And I think even a lot of people here recognize that, um, that a, a lot of the problems in the world are a result of seeing the world as a commodity, seeing it as something that you simply consume, uh, and there's a type of human arrogance that goes with that. But one of the things that he said, he, 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 he basically argued that the biggest problem in the Muslim world was a confusion of knowledge. And, and he said the confusion and error in knowledge created a condition for what he called the loss of adab within the community. And, and that condition arising out of one and two, the confusion and error in knowledge and then the loss of adab, has led to a rise of leaders who are not qualified for valid leadership of the Muslim community and who do not possess the high moral, intellectual, and spiritual standards required for Islamic leadership. So he makes an argument that it's really a confusion of knowledge. And I think one of the things that you and I share is trying to restore knowledge as a basis for uh, as a starting point, really. And so I know that you have the, the university that uh, you've been working on in Pakistan, among other amazing things. I mean, I've, I've followed uh, some of your political career, um, and, I, and I, I think like the reforestation project is, is, is a really interesting project, um, trying to uh, bring back uh, the trees that have been lost. Ibn Khaldun mentions that the, uh, when, the, when the Arabs went across from uh, uh, across Africa, he said that you could, that you could, uh, a squirrel could literally uh, go from Egypt to Morocco without touching the ground because there were so many uh, trees. So we've seen a real loss of that. But I'm curious what, 
you know, just how you see the centrality of knowledge and restoring that uh, as part of this uh, restoration of civilizational pride for a community. You're right about, you know, when you have total divorce from uh, the sacred and you just uh, operate on the material, and which is basically what is happening. I, and then with the problems because of that, for instance, I mean, the, this big environmental disaster in the world, which is called climate change, is purely because uh, there's uh, human beings have moved so far away from the sacred. And sacred basically means being humane, thinking about others. It means, you know, uh, the, uh, the saying of a prophet, peace be upon him, that he lived for the next world as if you'll die tomorrow for the next world. So your deeds should be such that if you die tomorrow, you, you can stand in front of the Almighty and be held accountable. But live in this world as if you will live for a thousand years. So whatever you're doing right now, you should think the repercussions it will have on humanity for another thousand years. So it's one of the greatest statements, you know, about, I mean, it, it just completely envelops everything about environment, about how we should be treating the way we live on this earth. So that also, I believe this whole envir environmental movement is sacred. Wherever you think about other human beings, you know, you are, because God, whatever you do for God's, if you want to get close to the Almighty, you have to be humane. So um, what I find, unfortunately, basically the leadership that comes up through this political system, you know, they just are too divorced from, um, from, the, from Iman, from tenets of their faith. And so basically they come in for power and then they compromise for staying in power and power is for personal benefits. And it's all over really, most of the politicians. Very few politicians I find come with a specific objective of looking after humanity. Their main object is to, the benefits of power and most of the developing world, it is coming into power for self-interest, how much money they can make. So unfortunately, you know, there are very few Mandelas, someone who came in for a higher cause. Um, and you know, our great leader, Jinnah, who, who was uh, the founder of Pakistan, someone like him who, you know, came in uh, and sacrificed himself for this uh, great cause. Uh, so, un which is why politi politicians are looked down upon in the world, because they say they're coming to help the people, and they really help themselves. This is a, a, a huge problem, and I think it's interesting from a spiritual perspective, uh, a lot of the, the, the ethical traditions that we have, and not just in the Muslim community, it, the source of this is actually is arrogance. And because it's, it's the idea that the human being somehow uh, has only responsibility to himself that he's not responsible to, to anything above himself. So he, 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 in essence, makes himself like a god. And, and, and that gets to how do we, um, just in terms of as a community, how do we uh, get out of the conditions uh, that, that we find ourselves in? Because I think a lot of Muslims, you know, have looked at the Muslim world for some time and seen the type of, uh, rulers that that exist in the Muslim world and I think there's there's so much animosity unfortunately so instead of like praying for people because one of the things that traditionally like in the Imam Tahawi's uh, creed he says that we, we have to pray for our leaders that there's this idea that as you are so are the people put over you so that if the people themselves are corrupt uh, they very often get that type of leadership so how do we get out of that situation? I mean, I know the, the trials and tribulations that go with leadership. Like I said, I, I run a very small uh, college and, and the headaches that I have just from that, um, the lack of sleep, the, the difficulties that come with that. And so I, I can't imagine the type of burden that somebody like yourself would have on your shoulders. So how, what, you know, what's the light at the end of the tunnel that's not an oncoming train? You know, Sheikh Hamza, you know, when I started 
politics. I only came into politics. If I did not have Iman or faith, I would never have come into politics because I had everything. I mean, I, I, I was a, already a big name in my country, a sports star, and I had, you know, respect and I had, um, you know, the money I wanted for my life, I had enough money. So, you know, for me to spend 22 years of my life struggling to, you know, um, uh, uh, become a prime minister, you know, it made no sense. Why would someone like me who had everything? So the only reason was I believed that I had a responsibility to my society because I was given more than others. You know, the whole test of a human being, according to, uh, I think, all religions, is that if God gives you, he will test you according to what he's given you in life. The hereafter test, the test are when, we, when, we meet our, uh, when, we, when we meet our God, he will test us what did we do with all the benefits and privileges and, uh, you know, uh, uh, his blessings he gave us. So I figured out, and I had already had faith uh, before I came into politics. And I came into politics because I had faith. And because I had faith, I realized that I was so blessed that I had a responsibility to the society. So I wanted to make Pakistan an Islamic welfare state based on the concept of the state of Medina by our Prophet, peace be upon him. And I also, you know, looked at his struggle. You know, he's, the Almighty made him struggle for 13 years. So I figured out that, you know, uh, if, if he could make his, uh, you know, the, the person he loved the most to struggle, then, and we were told to follow his way, his sunnat. So, so I, that's how I did it. Because I did not think that I was going to make any, you know, any personal gains or uh, uh, some benefits of power. I came in because I thought we should make Pakistan, uh, uh, make the state on the principles of the state of Medina. And I always believe one thing that, you know, despite all the difficulties and adversaries and disappointments, I believe that, you know, we human beings only have, God has only given us the power to struggle. Whether we succeed or not is not in our hands, as was shown by, you know, the life of our prophet, because for 13 years he struggled, and they were a very tough struggle. And then when he, uh, did the hijrat to Medina, uh, he didn't know that it would be the beginning of his rise. And even then in Medina for first five years, it was a real struggle. So therefore, you know, for me, it was just a struggle. And I, uh, and I have this ideal that we want to have this country based on two principles. One is it should be a welfare state, a humane state, which takes care of its bottom uh, 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 strata of the society. And secondly, rule of law, the fundamental uh, principle of a civilized society is where you bring the powerful under the law, and which is the biggest problem in, in the developing countries because we don't have rule of law. Powerful have one law and the, and the weak are, are judged by another law. So the jails are all filled by the poor people. The rich crooks never get into jails. So, so these two concepts are the basis of what my struggle is about for Pakistan. I don't think that's just a problem in the developing countries, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of people that should be in jail in, 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 the, uh, in Europe and America are not in jail. So I think that that seems to be a, a major problem. I, you know, in, just in coming to a, a winding it down, I, you know, I think it seems to me that you've taken on an incredible challenge and uh, it's very inspiring, and I think a lot of Muslims, I know a lot of Muslims here are inspired by it. The, one of the most successful communities in, uh, in the United States is the Pakistani community and diaspora. And in fact, the college that I'm running and right now that I'm in is largely here because of, of Pakistani immigrants to America. I mean, we've, 
we've had the, the, the real backbone of our support has been from South Asians, from largely Pakistani, but also Indian and, and Arab uh, and, and other uh, groups. And it's, the Pakistani community here is, is a very successful community. And there's a very interesting book. It was, it was somewhat controversial when it came out, but I actually found it very uh, uh, eye-opening. And it was a book by uh, these two Harvard researchers. It was called The Triple Package. I don't know if you ever saw the book. But it looked at the, it looked at the most successful communities in the United States. And one of them was the Pakistani community that they looked at. And they identified three qualities of their success. Um, that, that's what they called the triple package. And the first one was they had a sense of superiority, which, which I thought was very interesting. And it wasn't so much in an arrogant type of way, but they really saw themselves somehow as exceptional. And they said that that view could be a, a religious uh, exceptionalism, like the Jewish community, um, like a chosenness. Uh, or it could be ethnic or national. And, but the second quality that they identified was a sense of insecurity, that they had something really to prove. Um, and that it created a kind of tension uh, that forced them to really work harder than the other people uh, because they wanted to show that they were worthy of that exceptional status. And then the third quality that they identified was delayed gratification, um, that they were able to put off. And, and that gets back to what you were talking about, about discipline, because certainly I, I know that anybody that becomes a world-class athlete delays gratification. They have to because of, of, the, of, of the type of uh, discipline and effort it takes. And so those were the three. But what struck me about that is I really felt that the Quran in some ways was a triple package book. Because on the one hand, it says things like, you know, that kuntum khayra ummatan ukhrijat linnas. You're the best community that's come forth for humanity. And then on the other hand, it says things like, you were created from a vile fluid. You know, that uh, the human being is, is, is of earth. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said, kullukum min adam wa adam in turab. All of you are from adam and adam is from dust. He said, uh, I was commanded to be humble so that nobody could show arrogance uh, towards another person. And then the third thing was this delayed gratification, uh, which the Quran in so many verses tells us to put off for, for what's uh, coming, you know, that, that not to, to take things now. So I feel um, those three things, the restoration of that um, in, in your country, I think, uh, it seems to me that you yourself uh, uh, display those qualities and, and how we can restore that in the greater community seems to be the challenge that we face. You see, Sheikh Hamza, I feel that uh, in Pakistan, this country has tremendous potential. People are immensely talented. They're quite diverse. We have a very diverse mix of... Uh, ethnic groups in Pakistan, uh, very talented. Uh, problem is, you know, we haven't, you know, if I look back why we haven't achieved our potential, it's one, you know, one sentence, rule of law. We have, you know, we have had elite capture. So a society where a, a certain elite just captures the resources and deprives the majority of proper education, healthcare, uh, justice, um, and so, you know, if I had to put my finger on it, it's a it, lack of rule of law is the reason why we haven't achieved our potential. And I, I actually am convinced that no society, no society can ever achieve its potential if there is not rule of law. Because merit is also associated with rule of law. And if you do not have meritocracy in a society, you have this elite which is... Uh, which, uh, which is spoiled, which is rich, which has captured the resources, which doesn't struggle and strive. They sit on the main positions. They decay. So countries uh, disintegrate because of a decadent elite. People don't decay. It's the elite that decays. And what our prophet showed in, in Medina was that, you know, he brought in a very uh, selfless, an elite which looked upon him as a role model, all of them became leaders, 
and they just lifted the character of the entire nation and, and, the, and the potential, unleashed the potential. Because all of us have tremendous potential. But we, we have imposed chains on us which stops us from achieving the potential. Our great poet Iqbal, he was, you know, our greatest poet um, of this last century. You know, he, he came up with the concept of the Shaheen, the eagle. That eagle flies, soars above the rest because it breaks the shackles which keeps others grounded. And, and all these shackles of materialism, these false gods of uh, power and, you know, all these things that keep us grounded. And basically, that's what happened when the, when the Prophet uh, set up the state of Medina. He unleashed the potential of these people who were nothing before and all became, you know, the leaders of the world. So I believe Pakistan is in the same situation. We have this, people have great potential. They go outside Pakistan, they have a level playing field, they excel. But in this country, it's a, a system does not allow them as I said, this elite capture with a, with a ed education, quality education is only for a small, maybe 1%, 1.5%, 1 the rest do, do not have access to it. And similarly, you know, they don't have opportunities, uh, don't have level playing field. So what I feel is that by two things, by, by uh, and this is the struggle going on right now in Pakistan, but winning the struggle will unleash the potential of this country. And secondly, to lift the people out of poverty. So we've, in, our, in, in the country's history, we've, we've uh, started the greatest welfare plans uh, programs ever in our history. We, we are spending most money on, on the bottom people to sort of raise their levels. So this is basically my ambition. And I feel that if I can just uh, do these two things, lift people out of poverty, uh, create wealth so that, you know, you can spread it around and uh, break the monopoly of this uh, elite, this, these mafias. I feel this country, you know, I, I, I always believed it had great potential. It's a great vision and I really uh, pray that, uh, that you have tawfiq uh, in, in that, in realizing that. I, 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 there's a novel that was um, that was written here, and I think they made a film out of it called The Reluctant Fundamentalist about a Pakistani who had a bad experience in America. And when, and when he, he, go, he ends up going back to Pakistan and being a teacher, but one of the things that he said in, in, in a class to his students that in America they have this thing called the American dream. And then he asked the question of what's the Pakistani dream? And I think uh, you've articulated a very powerful uh, Pakistani dream that inshallah I really hope that it's realized in your lifetime that you see the fruit of uh, the labor and it seems to me to be a struggle against arrogance and haughtiness um, I, because people that see themselves as above the law are arrogant people um, yeah and so I think pride is definitely uh, that negative uh, is is what we're up against and what we have to fight in ourselves and then in in uh, in the society around us.